a huge majority of our applicants would write this large paragraph telling us mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I love video game music. I've always been in love with video game music. We've got a waiting list of like 10, like 10 cellists, like cellos just Whoa. waiting to like play for us. So like 10 of them, like, oh my God. <laughs> Welcome to the Gamer Symphony Dreams podcast, where we invite you to join us for an interesting and meaningful conversation on video game orchestras and video game music. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Gamer Symphony Dreams podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Ng. Today, I am here with Galen Wolkamp Moon, the founder and chair and James Curl, the music director of the London Video Game Orchestra. Welcome, guys. Hey. hey. Thanks for having hey. us. So can you first tell us about your background? Um, what is your musical background? And also, what is your video game background? Uh, let's start with Galen. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so my musical background is um, well, I haven't really started playing musical instruments until I was about 15 years old. So I didn't even really pick up anything until then. And then from there, I started playing clarinet in the local high school band. And from there, it just became, I became fascinated with loads of different instruments. So I started picking up my friend's flute and oboe and saxophone. So then I started getting fluent in all these different woodwind instruments. And by the time I left high school, I was able to play all the woodwind instruments and even wow. start picking up brass. <laughs> um, but yeah, I never actually went to university or anything like that for music. Um, I joined the Drum and Bugle Corps in the United States Air Force. Um, so I was with them for a while, but I was playing percussion for them. Um, and then I took a very long hiatus and didn't actually play, um, pick up an instrument again until I was about 30 years old, I guess. Um, so yeah, from there I started joining local um, like community orchestras and community bands, wind bands and that kind of stuff. Uh, so for video games, um, I started off very young. Um, so I was born in the 70s and during that time we had a console called Intellivision, which was, is very weird. It has like a remote control like type of controller, which is very, very unique and very weird and bizarre. But they were in competition with like Atari and that kind of stuff. Um, in television didn't do well at all. Um, oh I can't even remember who made it. Um, but I still remember the games like Burger Time and stuff like that. So I knew you could get that on uh, PC <laughs> and they started doing other stuff like that. And I was probably one of the first kids to get a regular Nintendo. My dad would um, like, he got me really interested in playing all the games. So I started, um, one of my first games was Dragon Quest. Um, mm -hmm. It was called Dragon Warrior on the NES. And this was back in 1986, I believe. Um, so I became addicted to that game. And ever since I've just fell in love with scores and music and everything for, for games, so. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> James, what about you? Oh, well, I'll start with music as well. So I had a, um, I was blessed. My dad was a folk accordionist and my mum was a classical pianist. So they really uh, gave me very opposite spectrums of interest in terms of music. And so I loved improvising and I loved playing from an early age. And yeah, I mean, I kind of, I always knew I wanted to do music with my life. So um, yeah, got involved with stuff. Ended up going to Manchester in the UK to, to study music there. And then uh, a little bit of conducting uh, after that as well. And yeah, it's just been wonderful to explore the UK's extremely varied music scene for the last couple of years. Um, I'm a trombonist by trade and that allows, that instrument allows you to get involved with everything from jazz to ska to classical and then to things like video game music as well. So uh, it's just been such a pleasure to uh, learn a little bit more about London and the music that's happening here and then to learn that there are these video game music communities all over the world even more incredible so yeah and in terms of video game background I came to it quite late to be honest I didn't get into video games till about 2008 2009 mm -hmm. through um, series like Elder Scrolls and Mass Effect so RPGs mostly uh, but then my education has broadened rather significantly in the last two years with this amazing community of musicians here at LVGO. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. 
Um, Galen, can you tell us about how you came up with the idea for the London Video Game Orchestra and any kind of research you did prior to starting the LVGO? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've, when I first heard like a uh, Final Fantasy Distant Worlds come into London, it's like I had to get a ticket like to go to the first one. And, and I actually happened to miss it, miss the first one, but I was here for the second time that they came and they performed at the Royal Albert Hall and it was just absolutely stunning oh, and beautiful. It's like, so I fell in love with like just watching live work is just playing the music and having a uh, video game uh, gameplay behind them. Um, whilst I played. So that was like, that was just awesome. Um, and then after that, I just started becoming addicted to like go into video game concerts. So I saw like the Zelda 25th anniversary concert that was held at the Hammersmith Apollo here. And it was hosted by Zelda Williams. So that was Robin Williams' oh, wow. daughter. That's so so cool. she was there. And at the time, Robin Williams would have hosted it, but he was um, on his honeymoon. Um, so, he, <laughs> um, so he wasn't able to, so. But Zelda was there and that was just awesome. It was just perfect for it. Um, and then I've watched like the Sony PlayStation in concert. I watched like video game heroes in concert. So it, it's all these kind of things that like set this inspiration. It's like, I, I really would love to have like a video, like a community orchestra just playing video game music. So the orchestras that I joined and the, the wind bands that I was part of, I kept on asking them to change up the repertoire a bit and it's like put in some video game music it's like you guys do tv and film why not put in some video game music um so uh, i was able to put some influence on one of my wind bands to play some video game music we had a geek concert so it was just <laughs> it was like sci-fi tv and film and uh video game music that concert sold out and got so much popularity oh, wow. And it's like, oh my God, it's the first time and the only time that orchestra, that wind band has ever done that. So ever since then, they've, they struggled to even get tickets. Um, mm -hmm. But I knew there was a market for video game music at the time. Um, I can't remember what year that was. I think that was in 2014, maybe 2015. Um, so then I wanted to see where I can go with it. So I started off with a small little ensemble. Um, I created the London Video Game Ensemble. So it was eight members and we were going commercial. So this was just a very, it was a commercial endeavor that wanted to see if we can make money, go to pubs and bars and that kind of stuff and book ourselves. Um, and after a couple of rehearsals, it just became really unfeasible. Um, trying to get everybody together um, to rehearse and then the cost of rehearsal venues as well, just for eight people. Yeah, it's a lot. So each each time we had to pay um, between uh, ten and fifteen, um, ten and fifteen pounds, which is about about fifteen to twenty dollars um, each, mm -hmm. just to go for one night of rehearsals. So that didn't really work out. So then I approached James and asked him if he would be interested in doing a full orchestra, full size orchestra, and just see what we can do with that. <laughs> and um, yeah, from there, that's that's how we how the idea came about, and um, I guess I can tell you a bit about about, about how we set it up in, a bit later. Yeah. So, um, James, what? How did you meet Galen, and what was the process like for starting up the orchestra together? Did you have to do any kind of paperwork to become an orchestra in London? Gosh, yeah. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, Anyone playing video game music knows that because of the how recent all of this music was written, copyright is a big thing. In terms of how this orchestra started, well, Galen and I met in 2017 in sort of October time when I was conducting a classical orchestra that Galen played clarinet in. Um, and yeah, started talking. Galen introduced this idea, as he says. So then a year later, September, October 2018, I believe it was, um, we were like, right, let's make this happen. Let's see what we can do. And so it was over the next couple of months that we came up with a brand, LVGO, and, um, you know, started wondering how on earth we were going to find players, how on earth we were going to do concerts, how on earth we were going to sort the music, source the music. Um, and so that all happened from about November, late November until April, when our first rehearsal happened, where we had... How many was it getting? Like about 45 people at the first rehearsal? Yeah, the first like rehearsal that. was about 45, oh, almost good. 50 um, people, yeah. It was wonderful. And we, we were so nervous that, you know, I mean, how many things could go wrong? Like, everyone turn up at the wrong place? 
like no one likes each other or something, uh, you know, a super competitive atmosphere. What we ended up with was the loveliest group of people who were so keen to make this thing come to life. And I think we knew from day one that, that we, we had sort of uh, won the lottery a bit with, with the players. But then I think that community has already, always been there. There's just been nothing for them, you know, to, to make this music in London. So, uh, yeah, what luck. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, that's been the experience I've seen with other, you know, video game orchestras. Like, people are there, but you have to build it and they'll, you know, they'll come out of the woodwork and, you know, show up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Um, Galen, can you tell us how you set up the orchestra financially? Like listeners mm -hmm. are probably wondering, like, where do you get the initial capital for starting an orchestra like that? And mm. um, like approximately how much do you think that somebody would need to spend to start up their own orchestra in London? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the way that we've, we've, we work. I, I wanted to have about, I wanted to have three terms a year with 10 weeks each term. Um, so you had to, I had to think about how much would it cost a rehearsal venue to hire a rehearsal venue for 10 weeks for just one term. And then, um, so start get, going around getting quotes and trying to find an average. Um, and then after finding that average, then I would, um, I'd have to like put out, uh, I'll put out there, um, like in GoFundMe, for instance. I think, I think we did have a, a GoFundMe when we first started um, to start raising that initial capital, um, but we needed to at least cover um, uh, the first few rehearsals, and without that, then it was, yeah. I think it, I would have started had to put in my own money, um, my, um, and dig into my savings a bit just to to cover those first few rehearsals. But the GoFundMe was actually pretty successful that we we were able to secure the entire first term um, just on um, on some of the donations. And we even got some early membership fees coming in, which paid for it. So it, that was a big um, like sigh of relief after getting, so, getting that initial capital. Um, so after that, it was, um, I felt a lot, more, a lot more comfortable and a lot more secure. Um, of getting the rehearsal venues and that kind of stuff. So yeah, absolutely. One of the tactics we did is we offered a discount if members paid for a year's membership up front, which gave us the uh, as as well as the GoFundMe page that like um, getting set up wonderfully. Uh, it gave us like a great head start to be able to book rehearsal venues. Oh, uh, sorry, concert venues as well as rehearsal venues. Yeah. Um. So that would be if if there are any aspiring video game leaders out there. Um. Yeah, a great thing to do is to engage with your orchestra, see who's willing to like put money for a year, which, you know, it's not much a year's membership, is it? It's like a hundred quid or something. Um, but it just, if 10 people do that, all of a sudden the orchestra's got a chance. Yeah, definitely. And it, it is a bit, t it is a bit taking a risk as well, like not having met at all for the first rehearsal and then asking them to put money up when we had, they haven't even met us yet. And I think when we first started the GoFundMe, we didn't even have a logo. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it felt very, I don't know, like very amateur, very beginner-ish that um, mm. it, it was kind of hard to ask for that kind of money up front. Um, but I'm glad we did. And I'm, I'm glad we had the, the members to, to really engage with us that way. So it sounds like you guys just crowdfunded your orchestra. <laughs> yeah, to very, yeah, at the very beginning, yeah. <laughs> um, so the people who initially donated for that crowdfunding, or, were they just family or friends, or was it just even people you didn't know? A uh, mixture of both. Um, we've we had a, a very large um, donation from uh, someone in the orchestra um, that really helped out. So um, we really think that person. So that, that was a really really big help to begin with. Um, yeah, and I didn't even know this person to begin with either. Mm -hmm. So um, so that, that was a, a really nice surprise as well. So where did you kind of, um, I guess, advertise your crowdfunding campaign so that, you know, people that you didn't know would donate? Um, I guess through our personal Twitters and on Facebook, um, we didn't really have a Facebook page yet, or I think we were in the process of setting up a Facebook page. We must have had one. Um, we did. Like I mean, one. Between the two of us, we, we knew 
quite a varied group of musicians in London who, mm -hmm. after talking to friends, I think we had reached at least a part of the base that we wanted to yeah. you know, get interested. So it was mostly like social media word of mouth, to be honest, rather than anything mm -hmm. that we paid for advertising wise. Well, that's cool. And it sounds like you guys already did the groundwork by knowing a lot of musicians by being in other groups that yeah. you were more able easily to do rather than if you just weren't part of any network, it'd probably be harder to, to be successful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. think that this setting up an orchestra is like this only possible when you've got you know, you, a couple of feelers out. So if anyone's interested again in doing this, go and meet some people at an orchestra, find some online forums, people who love this music in the city that you're in and like it will be possible definitely yeah awesome so um i guess uh galing what you said was like you just have to work backwards you have to find out like how many seasons you want to do in a year and then you have to uh, divide it by like how like research your area how much like the venue costs them, and then kind of work backwards and then you determine like how much money that you should be raising for for your crowdfunding yeah cool um, so Galen, can you talk about your role in the orchestra and your, and your kind of your responsibilities? Um, I know you mentioned that, uh, there is like a board of trustees. Um, mm -hmm. can you tell me also about like, what are the qualifications to serve and what, what are those responsibilities? Yeah, sure. So, um, I, I'm the chair of the, the orchestra. So, um, basically what a chair does is they would, um, chair uh, trustee meetings or committee meetings and um, make sure everything is covered on the agenda and all the important um, items are on the agenda. I mean, it's very, it can be a bit boring because it's not like musical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess like you get bogged down in all the, the administration and stuff. But we've got a, bo a board of four trustees um, at the moment. Um, one of them, Matt, handles a lot of the finances. Um, the other one does a lot of the admin um, type stuff for us and um, also concert management. So that's like booking venues, having a look at venues, doing a recce, um, that kind of stuff, making sure that um, we've got the proper equipment that we need, um, sourcing uh, the um, the spare equipment and uh, lighting stands, the music stands, that kind of stuff, all that, that, that kind of spare um, sundries and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, so I just make sure that it's all run smoothly and that um, we've got the proper insurances sorted out. Um, the budget is on, on budget or that we have a proper budget in, in place, that the cash flow is there and we're not going to go into financial ruin or debt and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the, the main important um, roles of the trustees and the, for all the trustees we all have the same obligation of making sure that it's financially viable and that we hold our um, charitable objectives um, um, so our main charitable charitable objective is to um, to raise awareness of video game music in the community and and raise it as a proper art form of music um, um, and raise it on par with like other genres like classical and and film music and that kind of stuff so Mm -hmm. we, that's our main our main goal so and all the trustees have to hold that hold up that responsibility and obligation to do so fantastic do you um for your trustees you said there's four right yeah is that all the admin staff that you have for your orchestra yeah at the moment there's there's only the four of us um we do have a recruitment process if we need more um we were actually on the lookout for another trustee right before COVID happened and then COVID happened. So it kind of like messed with everything. So, um, so right now in the, uh, we're not actively looking for other trustees, but we would usually put, go through a recruitment process. Um, mm -hmm. And um, basically it's just an informal interview really with other people and to see um, what kind of skills they can bring to the board and to the orchestra and, um, and how much, um, excitement they have for like for the charity and the and video game music okay so your process is just like a casual interview it's 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 not like an election mm. by the no membership. no we don't no we don't have elective um elected trustees okay. um but our governing document does say that um a certain percentage of trustees have to be from the orchestra um okay. we we've only recruited one trustee from outside the orchestra um to do our finances but that's it um 
um, the rest of us are actually part of the orchestra. Okay. And then when you said you look at the budget and make sure you guys are not going to go into financial ruin and all that, yeah. do, do you, have you gotten any kind of financial training or trustee training um, as part of like your role? Um, we've we're actually been in the process of doing that. We've had a workshop that was set up in April, but because of COVID, oh. that can <laughs> the, the the workshop was canceled. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, one of the trustees on the board is actually a deputy CEO for another charity, and he's got extensive charitable charity work, um, like charity experience, and he serves on multiple boards as well, and he's chaired other boards. So he's he's definitely got that qualification as well as having a master's in charity um, in the charity sector. Um, so that, that really helps us um, with that. Yeah. I think that's very important because um, one, one of the things I think some, some orchestras some, who are like community groups that I've seen they're they kind of don't have that background. And so they don't, it's harder to like not know what you don't know kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So, I was just kind of curious to see like where, cause it sounds like you guys really have, you guys are on top of the financials. So I was just mm -hmm. curious to see kind of like where that came from. I think if, yeah, so I mean, we're very, very lucky to have, to have someone like our board member who's extremely experienced, but actually advice, which has worked in other orchestras as well is just contact other community groups. If you're ever unsure again about what you might not know, just you know treasurers in other orchestras other theater groups they'll be so happy to share their experiences you've got to take some things with a pinch of salt of course but um yeah you know, like it's it's i you know charities are generally very happy to talk to one another about financial advice uh, so yeah another top tip i'd say yeah, yeah totally that's a good tip yeah don't be afraid to ask for help mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> So, so James, can you talk about your role as the music director? Um, what are your responsibilities and how do you decide the program for the concerts? Oh, deciding the program, that's the fun one. Um, <laughs> so we, before every concert, about seven or eight months before each concert, we send out a theme like adventure or something. Um, and then we ask players to send in their suggestions for pieces or games or suites from games. And then uh, it's mine and Galen's job to look at these, see which ones are appropriate, which ones we can source music for, which ones we can actually perform legally, <laughs> of course. Um, and then I whittle down it, in, it, it whittle it all down into something of a musically coherent performance as well. So in terms of choosing music, it's very much everyone pushes their ideas forward, and then we whittle away until it all sort of makes sense uh, with the theme that we've chosen. Uh, in terms of my role, um, uh, it's very much um, hands-on in rehearsals in terms of leading and conducting, uh, being in touch with anyone who has musical questions, uh, working with the arrangements and the arrangers, making sure that um, you know things are actually playable for different instruments. Uh, Galen does an awful lot of this as well, which he's not said in his, uh, his thing, <laughs> like in terms of working with arrangers and uh, contacting players uh, he's absolutely incredible at doing this um uh so aside from being in touch with players in the moment in the rehearsals and leading uh rehearsals i'll obviously be there and in charge on concert day in terms of uh getting the pace of rehearsal right and making sure that we're all at a good standard um yeah and i think one of the wonderful things about this community is that we're not all worried about wrong notes. I think there's this great obsession with mistakes in community orchestras, all orchestras really. Um, so right from day one, our approach as an orchestra has been find the phrase, find where this bit of music goes. And then, you know, right notes can be fixed very, very easily. So I, I think one of the things I love about the, the my role as musical director is everyone's openness and how they are able to just engage with the phrase and fix things as we go. So that makes my job very easy indeed. That's, that's great to hear. Um, and I wanted to ask the both of you, what, so you know your orchestra is a, a community amateur orchestra. Can you tell me about who joins your orchestra and why? Get it, go, uh, do you go yeah, first. Yeah, yeah, I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, so really it's um 
it's anybody who really uh, um, applies for a, a position in the orchestra. Um, so we've we've got a section on our website now where most where we get a huge majority of applications through now. And um, on there, there's always like a section of um, why do you want to join. Um, so we don't hold auditions or anything like that, but we need to make sure that they are actually interested in video game music and know that we do play just video game music and that kind of stuff. And we need to make sure that, that they are comf a bit comfortable and confident in playing in their playing skills. Um, so, so a huge majority of our applicants would write this lar large paragraph telling us mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I love video game music. I've always been in love with video game music. Um, I go to Comic-Con, I dress up. And um, so they like a lot of them do a lot of cosplay and stuff. So it's like that kind of enthusiasm is like, oh my God, this is like the people that we want in this orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really not that difficult finding these, these kind of enthusiastic players at all um, to like come to us. James, any thoughts? Oh, yeah. We've been completely inundated, haven't we, Galen? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, wish, I wish we could do an orchestra triple the size, but uh, it's just uh, rather impossible. So um, we, we have filled virtually all positions in the orchestra, um, uh, which is just incredible. And the community is wonderful. Uh, but yeah, it's sad that we can't have more because there are certainly more that have got in touch to us. Yeah. In terms we, of why... We so no go for it go for it well, uh, yeah i was gonna say um we've got a waiting list of like 10 like 10 cellists like cellos just Whoa. waiting to like play for it so like 10 of them like oh my god <laughs> so yeah there's um there's a lot of demand trying to uh, for for players to to join us um although tuba was extremely difficult to find oh we found one now though yeah we? we finally found a tuba we've got a tuba player <laughs> <laughs> and he recently bought the biggest tuba he possibly could. I think it's the second biggest double B flat you can buy with money. So we're in trouble when we. <laughs> That's going to be fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, you mentioned that you guys don't do auditions. So um, how do you do your screening process and decide who gets to join? There isn't really a screening process. It's 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 more informal. Um, uh, we we've we've welcomed people who are really mixed abilities. I think that's wonderful because as I said before, like our agenda has never been to get this sounding perfect. I think it's a phantom. It's an illusion to get anything sounding perfect. Um, but I think we've very much inspired a community of everyone work with the player next to you. Some people are better at rhythm. Some people are really in tune. We can all work together to get better. And so it's been a much more informal process of, um, you know, who plays solo roles, who is happy to sit more in the background. And I think this is all, this was kind of what we spoke about from day one, wasn't it, Galen, in terms mm -hmm. of wanting a really welcoming atmosphere. Um, and, you know, aud auditions can be useful, but uh, we've not seen, we've not found a need for them at the moment. You know, we, mm -hmm. in our initial message, I can't remember what we said. We said something like, you know, recommended grade seven, but all abilities are welcome. Was that what we wrote? Yeah, yeah I think we reduced it down to like grade five. Okay. Um, so, so for like the American standard, I can't remember what kind of standard you guys use in America, but over here it's called ABRSM. Um, mm -hmm. So that um, you get graded and you um, gain certain levels, eight to be in the top, um, the top level. Um, but like, I would say that more middle school bands and stuff would be like a five, I guess, when you graduate or like when you leave that kind of, sector so that kind of gives you an idea of what the skill levels are so it sounds like if you just tell people hey we play this level of music they could kind of uh like a gauge for themselves whether they feel comfortable you know joining whether they feel that they can actually play the music and then you guys don't have to go through like screening every single individual no yeah fortunately we've not had to do that and um I don't think we need to actually at this stage. No, We're making not a, at this stage. No. no, I'm very pleased with how the orchestra is sounding. We've made huge improvements. Um, yeah. yeah, check it out on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys also have a lot of arrangers that uh, arrange create arrangements for you, like Jason Graves, Andre Soto, Marcus Hedges, etc. How did you um, like find these arrangers? How did you decide to work with them? And what's the sheet music arrangement process like? 
Um, well, I can answer for those, those three that you mentioned. Um, so I've always been a massive fan of Jason Graves. <laughs> I've always <laughs> loved his music. I would like fanboy over his stuff, uh, um, especially like the Dead Space series. Um, so um, it was an idea to do like a, a horror Halloween type concert and stuff back in October. So I'm like, it would be so great if I can get, um, if I can ask Jason if we can play some of his music. Um, so I'm like, what the hell? I'll just I'll just email him out of the blue and just see if he he'll grant us permission to use his music. He did better than that. He actually gave us scores and parts for all of the music that that he had available for us <laughs> for free. <laughs> so for free, and he was absolutely in like in love with the idea of our orchestra. So um, we easily um, kind of grabbed him in for that, um, which is great. Um, for Andre Soto, I mean, the, so he runs a VGO score. And um, I think without his music being available and ready at the beginning, um, it would have been extremely difficult for us to get off the ground because um, of, of the a huge majority of the sheet music that we have is from VGO score and um, they're mostly his arrangements. Um, so that's how we were able to start and we um, supported his Patreon to um, gain access to the music. And that's how we were able to build up our library of music. Um, and then, uh, with Marcus Hedges, we 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 found a really great um, arrangement that he did for The Last of Us, The Last of Us Two, um, for this for the Halloween horror concert as well. So um, we asked him if we would be able to play his arrangement, um, but we had to meet him um, down in Brighton, which is on the south coast of England. Um, so I set up a meeting with him and talked it over, and um, he was more than happy to join on board as um, one of our. Uh, our arrangers um, and that's been a fantastic help um, and then James has been working with the arrangers to do um, certain arrangements so James you can take over on the rest of that <laughs> yeah I know so um, we obviously needed slightly more than those three as incredible as they have been they really have been incredibly generous so um, aspiring arrangers within the orchestra some of whom are, are students at universities and conservatoires here and others who has, just have experience arranging and we've been working with them to create arrangements as well. And, uh, and Galen and myself have also contributed some. Uh, and so they come from all different places. And every time we have to be very careful of the legal aspects and whether or not we can perform this music, but we, we've, we've done our, our diligence there. Um, yeah, I think mm -hmm. these, the big composers like Jason Graves and Gary Scheinman, they don't get the opportunity to have their music played much, I don't think you know, they get it recorded in a studio somewhere in Los Angeles. And then, you know, there are the community orchestras that ask to play this music. You're only going to get it played at a once in a decade celebration of de Dead Space or something. So yeah, I think there's a huge market for these composers wanting to actually hear their music played in real life. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the generosity for them to, to, for the most part, offer this music free of charge has been unspeakably kind uh, it's certainly something we would like to pay for when we've grown a little because this work should certainly be rewarded even yeah, from us as a community orchestra um but yeah we again so keep coming back to advice for anyone who wants to set up their own orchestra um check out andres soto's video score on youtube because it's a wonderful resource for that and then once again, reach out to your local communities and wherever you are, whatever country you are, you'll find composers everywhere who are really keen mm. to get involved in these kind of projects. Um, and yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to add on to that a bit as well. Um, like on top of like uh, recruiting for musicians, we've also had um, quite a few arrangers and composers coming to us asking to be part of, to be on board as well. Um, so we do have uh, quite a few external arrangers that do uh, uh, quite a bit of work for us, like Mark Choi and Ben Emberley, uh, for instance. So they they do quite a bit of work for us, and and it's great. It's it's really good having them both on board as well. Mm -hmm. And what we end up with is a huge variety of arranging styles, which is great actually. <laughs> and um, yeah, some some who have never written for a full orchestra before, but have you know extensive orchestration experience elsewhere, and others who have written for orchestra but never for the really specific challenge of video game music, which is, you know, it's quite a thing trying to arrange this music because there's often electronics involved. What do we do with that? And there's maybe speech in the middle. What do we do there? So yeah, it's a really unique challenge. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So when you guys are, you know, before somebody creates a new arrangement, do you do it so that you already chose the program first and then they arrange specifically for that theme? Or do you do it the other way around where somebody just arranges whatever they want and you try to fit, find the right pieces to fit into the program? No, we, we definitely ask for specific pieces. Um, mm. And we try when we're choosing the program to have at least a couple that have already been written so that we can start rehearsing those right away, basically. Um, and then we give you know, arrangers you know, a couple of months to actually get churn this stuff out. Uh, so yeah, we, we always try and set the program before the start of rehearsal so that everyone can actually listen to it and know exactly what they're doing. Okay, that's mm -hmm. good. Um, so do you guys, um, with, like with the arrangers in the orchestra or um, other than the professionals, do you have to like look at what their their level of skill or um, experiences in orchestration? Like, do you have someone who's just just fresh fresh beginner arranging for you guys? So yeah, we had a couple of projects this year where I mentored two orchestral members, um, and we spoke about orchestration techniques and how to write for this orchestra and where our strengths and weaknesses were. Um, and we had two fabulous arrangements for. Um, a couple of pieces in the last concert. So yeah, we're, we're very keen to do this. We can't do many because it's got a lot of work, but um, yeah, so we've had some aspiring arrangers who've actually never had the chance to do it before um, come up and step up to the plate. Would you say that most of your arrangers are like professional arrangers? I'd say the majority are, yeah. Majority um, are. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they've got extensive um, background in actual arranging and composing. Okay, cool. And then James, for the, um, you talked about, you have to make sure that like you guys can legally play the piece before you kind of program it. What's the process for that like? Well, usually um, PRS is very clear on, uh, sorry, PRS is the UK copyright system. I have no idea, not a clue what it's like <laughs> in the United States. Uh, yeah, maybe, I don't uh, either. No, so you'd have to talk, talk to local um, music copyright and firms. PRS are very clear of what music can be performed Companies are very clear on websites what music can be performed. Having charitable status or at least seeking charitable status uh, gives you an advantage because you're not make, making music for profit at all um, and you're not performing for profit. So uh, in those cases where it is allowed, it's just a case of asking permission and 98% uh, of the time you get a, a yes, go for it. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the sort of process. So it's very much get in touch with your local um, or you know, national copyright associations, which in the UK is PRS. And uh, again, if you're not sure about that, because it's a minefield, it's a tricky one, mm -hmm. talk to other orchestras, talk to other communities, or even contact one of those um, uh, copyright companies, because yeah, they usually are willing to help sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I would like to ask the both of you, do you guys have any words of wisdom um, for someone looking to start up an orchestra like yours? Yeah, I would say the main thing is just ask for help if you need it. Um, um, if, you, if you're not entirely sure what you're doing or that what you need to do, um, ask other groups that are in the same situation, or the, well, in the same situation, but also in the same kind of um, genre as well. Because so they'll definitely have to, uh, um, their own contacts and you could probably get in network and contact their contacts and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. Um, that's the main thing I would say. And, and my only thing I'd add to that is find yourself some players because you don't have to do it yourself. You know, we had advertising um, people. We had people who make websites turn up. We've managed to ask them for advice. Uh, and so, you know, if you can advertise on social media with other orchestras, with other groups, and you can get some expertise in with in some enthusiasm, then you'll find that you kind of build momentum in a kind of snowball effect. And we were, I think we are, I don't know if we were lucky or if we just found the right people. I think we mm -hmm. were very lucky, but yeah, if you, if you have a large membership right from the off, um, because there's an interest in the music you want to play, it makes everything easier. Mm. Yeah. There's just, the chances are you'll probably find someone who actually works in marketing and knows how to do marketing, social media, someone that works in IT knows how to work on a website and that kind of stuff. And possibly even someone that works in finance that could do the beer treasurer and that kind of stuff. So 
so yeah, it's, um, it's definitely out there. Awesome. So I know right now is kind of COVID time, but mm -hmm. Matt, um, once this is over, what do you what are you hoping to do with the LVGO? Yeah, you go oh, first. <laughs> like um, well, I, I mean, I'm I'm definitely hoping to get back in into the swing of things and um, filling up concert venues and and playing like massive shows. Um, but realistically, I don't know how feasible and how possible that's going to be with um, with the venues, but. I mean, it's always a hope it's, um, that we can get back to the way things were. I think it'll still be a few years before we can um, safely fill venues or, or the venues be comfortable enough to fill them. And it's also dependent on funding for each venue. Like we found out a lot of venues in London are actually closing, closing their doors permanently because they just don't have the funding and they're not able to secure funding. Hmm. Um, so I guess we'll have to see where we're at in the next six to 12 months. Um, but that I, is my hope. <laughs> I, I'm feeling I'm feeling quite positive. I think that I think the UK is uh, I think you know culture lovers, music lovers yeah. are seriously keen to get back um, to listening to these things. And it's not going to happen in 2020. It's just not. But I think you know um, hearing from the musicians' union here and with the movement of advice, unless there's some sort of sizable second wave, it looks like in 2021 even the beginning of 2021, some sort of rehearsals are looking like they're going to be feasible. Don't quote me on that. Um, but you know what? I'm not worried about LVGO at all. I'm not because, either. <laughs> nah, because the, the, you're like, everyone is so keen and we have been fortunate enough to sell out these concerts every time. So um, I think the appetite is still strong. And there's all sorts of opportunities from doing two concerts, two slightly shorter concerts where you know it's half full each time uh, concerts outside is more tricky logistically. Um, you know, concerts with a moving audience. There's all sorts of possibilities that many orchestras around the place are are doing. But yeah, quick statement that the UK is doing terribly for its arts industry. Yeah. The Conservative government. Oh, I probably shouldn't say the word on, <laughs> on a on a live video chat, so I shan't. But you can imagine what I want to really say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I ask you guys how do you how do you guys do fundraising? Like, do you guys get individual donations or do you do grants? Um, at, at the moment, we're not actually actively looking for fundraising. I mean, we're we're more than happy to take donations, um, um, but we don't actually have an active an active link for fundraising or for donations. Um, I think it's when we start to get a lot bigger and we need more instruments, we'd actually fundraise. Like, for instance, um, our percussion section, we could it would be amazing to have a full set of timpanis. Um, so we could fundraise specifically to raise money for, to, to get new temps and that kind of stuff or other equipment um, to have in-house. Um, um, that would be great. But at the moment, yeah, we're not really actively looking for um, any type of fundraising at the okay. moment. Yeah. So and even before COVID, you know, with ticket sales and um, musicians contributions to fees, uh, w w like everything was in the black which was very fortunate. Oh, yeah. so you mm -hmm. guys basically are able to su su financially support the orchestra just with membership dues and with ticket sales. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. Um, We've been very lucky. Yeah, very lucky. I, I mean, it, it helps having a very large orchestra as well. I mean, we've got 70 members now. So each of them paying their dues um, really helps add to, to our coffers. So, yeah. And how many um, people would you say came out to your concert? Oh God, I think our last venue, I can't remember the capacity at the last venue. Was it 300 or was it? 320, 315 to 320. So the last two were at capacity with that number. And then we had one before at Peckham, uh, mm. in Peckham, which was less, it was like 200. 200, yeah. 200, something, yeah. Wow. Um, and they, they both sold out within, uh, I think the, the, the latest concert sold out within um, a couple of days. So I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was ridiculously like amazing. It was so scary. Cool. I think we're, we're definitely, but we, you know, we've got a, you know, we are a community orchestra and oh, there's a hand in the background. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's, um, you know, we, we've got a really delicate balance to, to strike here because we are not a professional ensemble and uh, pitching our orchestra to the South Bank Centre, which is like a huge venue here in London. Um, I think it would be a mistake. It would be sending the wrong message to our players, to communities. You know, mm -hmm. 
we want we don't want to keep we want to maybe grow a bit more maybe like maybe five or six hundred people i don't know we, we haven't got a plan for that but you know the, the the target is not commercial success here that's mm. not what we're doing we want to bring this to local communities so um peckham historically has been quite a deprived place in terms of culture and we did these these two concerts here and mm. we had kids coming up to us afterwards who had never seen a live concert in their life and uh, I actually got contacted by one a couple of weeks later saying that that um, little Cyrus had started learning the violin as a result oh. of our concert. I don't think I've told you that, Galen. Uh, no, you uh, haven't. I mean, this is actually yeah, yeah. really nice to hear. Um, so, you know, this, you know, video game music, it can, oh, I'm now digressing, but, you know, video game music, it's live music that is not Mozart. Mozart's great, but, you know, it can really reach another generation and tell them, oh, this whole violin thing is pretty cool. So, you know, that's, that's what this charity is all about. Um, mm -hmm. And growing totally. in size is less important than bringing it to the people who we really want to show this to. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And we want to make it affordable and accessible to everyone of, of every class. So not just the, the wealthy that have to pay a hundred quid for a ticket to, to a concert. So I think that was yeah. part of Galen's initial pitch to me was, you know, I went to this Distant Worlds concert. It was one of the best things I've ever seen also completely unaffordable for most people mm, you know it, yeah, it, totally. like it, it sounded incredible but like um no no one like no one under a certain income level would be able to access that so they can come to our concerts instead <laughs> yeah, definitely. And i think they're more fun <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> well that's so cool that you guys are doing this um I got to ask you guys, what is your favorite game and your favorite song or soundtrack? Oh, no. um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I'll, I, I can quickly start on that one. Um, so my favorite game um, by far is it'll be the Dragon Quest series um, because I, I grew up on it back in the early 80s. Um, but I, I, I have a huge love and um, appreciation for Yoko Shimomura, um, who's, who's done like Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy and and so much more and I, I just i just loved her style and her music and and even um like with street fighter 2 is like a, it's a completely different genre of games but it, it's a really good score and soundtrack um but also like my, my favorite song i would have to say at the moment is hollow um from the final fantasy 7 remake and mm -hmm. that's actually sang sung by uh yosh from survive said the prophet um, and I'm just a big sucker for E minor key and, and that song is just so perfect and it's just so amazing and mellow. And, and that's actually one of the big projects that I want to do is create an arrangement for an orchestra, um, to play that, that, that piece of music. Um, so that's something I'm currently working on. Awesome. <laughs> In terms of my answer, that's, that's just, oh, it's a horrible, I, I feel like I'm betraying old friends by saying one. But I think if I had to say my favorite video game of the last couple of years, it'd have to be uh, Witcher 3 um, because of the unrivaled storytelling, I think, and depth of characters and world building um, and just yeah, range of social and political interactions boiled down to something that you can really change the course of in the game. Can't recommend it enough. I enjoy the music to it, but it could be better. In Witcher Three, um, so if I were to to name some music that's caught me most in the last couple of years, it would probably be the scores from Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild, which I think has been a pretty landmark bit of composing and scoring for, in terms of will word ah, world building, uh, that music is I think pretty unmatched in recent times. Fantastic. Um... Where can people follow you on, or your orchestra on social media? Um, so yeah, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, we're LVG Orchestra. Um, or you could probably just find us by looking up London Video Game Orchestra. And our website is uh, lvgo.co.uk. Um, and on there, we've also got web forms that you can send in comments or basic emails. And, um, and even our... Um, application processes through there and our email if you want to contact us by email is team at lvgo.co.uk 
Okay. Yeah, and if there's any budding arrangers or composers out there, get in touch because we, we want your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a lot of orchestras that need arrangements. <laughs> no. <I would>. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, Galen and James of the London Video Game Orchestra, thank you so much for joining me today on the conversation about your orchestra and how, um, you know, just giving other people out there ideas for how they can start an orchestra of their own. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. And thank you to uh, all the listeners for tuning in. Uh, so thanks again, Galen, James. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Cheers. Keep okay. playing music, everyone at home. <laughs> Do it. It's good for your health. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. Cheers. Bye. You've been listening to the Gamer Symphony Dreams podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know what topics you'd like to hear more about. Until next time, keep living you and your Gamer Symphony Dreams.